Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program, this program that is designed to get us into the Bible, the Bible, which is the Word of God. Oh, my, if only the whole human race would get that into their minds, the truth of it all, that when when God has given us the Bible, it is God's law book to the human race. It is the book that every human being has to be aware of because in it God tells us of his relationship to mankind and we're very, very accountable to him. It is so important, so important that we know what the Bible is saying. That's what's so marvelous about this program. We are so free, so free just to talk together about what does the Bible say. Because the Bible was not written to be readily understood, uh, God has written it in a very complex way uh, so that we have to search out the truth. We have to compare, the Bible says, spiritual things with spiritual. That is, the whole Bible is a spiritual book. Even though it's written in very earthly language, very normal language, uh, to many it is uh, virtually just a history book, and everything that is stated in the book, and that is a fact of history, and there's a whole lot of information, is absolutely true and trustworthy. It's exactly uh, the way it happened. It's uh, probably the most accurate, well, no, not even probably, it is the most accurate history book in the world because it doesn't carry the bias of mankind's thinking. It isn't written by somebody who wasn't aware of all the, the facets of what was going on at the time that his history was being unfolded. But the point of the Bible is not, first of all, to give us an account of history. It is to see in that history the spiritual meaning because Christ spoke in parables and uh, through those historical statements we are to learn more and more about the unfolding of this marvelous salvation plan which God has uh, made available to the human race uh, and had he not made it available then the only only thing that we could expect would be doom and gloom for every human being, me and, and everyone else. We'd all be ending up in hell because that is where we deserve to go because of our sins. But this is your program. We want to hear from you tonight. And uh, so shall we take our first call tonight, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Yes, how you doing? It's it's very low the phone. Um I have a question. I'm I'm I believe I'm in love with my girlfriend, the name's Kathy and she she doesn't believe in the word like I believe in the word. Are, are you talking about your spouse? My my not my spouse, it's my your girlfriend. Children. But yeah. Um <clears throat> I I was wondering is it okay to uh ask God Rather than go through churches and everything else the way everybody else does and put a ring on, and ask God with all you know humbleness and, and honesty to, to to that she could be my wife. I want to ask. I, I'm sorry, that. something is happening here. Your voice is fading in and out. Could you turn your radio off for one thing? If you have a oh my, we've lost our caller. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know. I, at least I want to touch on the subject that you have raised, even though I don't didn't get your question altogether. But the fact is that I, uh, this is a time of great tribulation, and that is not uh, simply a, a philosophical statement. It is a statement of fact. Great tribulation in not in the sense of 
great persecution with people being burned at the stake very regularly, which has happened at various times in history. Uh, uh, not uh, in the sense of uh, a lot of things that we call tribulation, but in the sense that in, in families, in all kinds of families, thousands upon thousands of families, where we uh, used to go to church together and we were so happy together going to church, feeling this was God's will. And now we find that... Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, a few in each family, maybe as little as one, maybe two, who see the truth of the Bible that we have to come out. God is commanding us to get out of the church uh, and no longer worship there, whereas the rest of our family, our husband, our wife, or our children, or some of our children, or our parents, or... Uh, anyway, dear ones that we love very, very dearly, and we've always been so happy together as what we call a Christian family, and now they can't see it at all. And so there is tension and there is uh, unhappiness now in the family. What are we to do? And, uh, you know, we have to be obedient to God. We have to do what God declares. Uh, uh, and we... But we also know that only God can open the spiritual ears and eyes of each one of us. And if we have loved ones who don't see it, if we have already come to the truth that we have to come out, uh, we have, are to come out, and then we can pray and pray and pray and beseech the Lord for his mercy that he will open the spiritual eyes and ears of our other loved ones. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's up to God entirely. And we do know finally that God does everything perfectly. But this is a time when those passages of, of the New Testament that we've read about very frequently uh, uh, are really coming to bear such passages that, uh, that uh, children will hate their parents and parents will... Uh, the mother will hate, uh, will be in, at odds with her daughter-in-law and and uh, father against son, and so on. There will be tension and uh, and difficulty right within the families that we never expected would happen. But this is because this is the time God is separating the wheat from the tares, and anyone who is not wheat that is a true believer will not see how in the world it makes any sense that we have to get out of the churches because they will, uh, without re realizing it, have come to a point where that is where their trust is. It's in the church that they had become saved. They believed it was in the church. They were assured of the, that uh, they were eternally secure and so on. But shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Kenton. So pleasant to hear your voice again. Um, please, um, Matthew 25, verse 32 and 33. Matthew 25, verse 32 and 33. Let's look at that. Matthew 25. Verse 32, and before him shall beget, and let's start with verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And to sit means to rule or to reign. Uh, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, what is your question? Brother Camping, uh, concerning left-right, um, in Ecclesiastics 10.2, God says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left hand. And in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, concerning the two thieves on the cross, 
God says, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand. And in the Gospel of John, God says, and two others with him, one on, e- on, on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. My question on these verses is, how do we know that the malefactor or the thieves, the thief that was saved of God was on the right or on the left? And does this matter? It doesn't matter, and we don't know because God doesn't tell us. God does not make an issue. We can't raise issues. We only uh, uh, deal with issues in the Bible, the meaning of a word or a phrase or a concept, when the Bible itself uh, is written in such a way that we have to have to look at that. But it is true that in Matthew 5, 25, now think of this, for example. In the Old Testament, when a burnt offering was offered that was typifying the Lord Jesus, normally it was a lamb, but it could be a calf, but it could also be a goat, a young uh, kid of a goat, a baby goat. And our one-year-old normally was a uh, uh, male, male goat. Uh, and, uh, and they all equally typified the Lord Jesus, no difference. Uh, so that sometimes goats were used in exactly the same sense as a lamb. In this case, God is making two uh, distinctions. One is that He is He is uh, cha- He is identifying the sheep with the true believers and goats with the unbelievers. The right hand with the true believers and the left hand with the unbelievers. But that doesn't mean at every place we read in the Bible about left hand and goats that it's talking about, that it cannot be talking about true believers. So there is uh, no statement in God's word of truth that says that the saved thief was on the right. No, it doesn't. That is not emphasized in the Bible, except here God is simply saying that there is a there is a separation and uh, and it just happens to be be uh, right hand versus left hand indicates separation, and so uh, uh, that's the, that's the the picture that God is painting here. Yes, sir. And also Second uh, Corinthians six verse seven. Second Corinthians chapter six verse seven. Okay, there we read Second Corinthians. Chapter 6, verse 7. We read by the... uh, uh, Let's start with verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, and so on, by the word, going down to verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. Now, you see, here God is using right hand and left hand in a little different fashion. He's simply indicating that whether we're going to the right or going to the left, that is all on, all around us. We want the armor of righteousness. Balance is that is that what we should understand here the, uh, to be balanced on either side all around? Well, yeah. In other words, it isn't just that we are are protected in one direction. We're protected in every direction by the armor of God. See, and one more quick verse, if you might please, um, would be in Psalm 19, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 19, verse 3 and 4. Let's look at that. Psalm 19. Verse 3 and 4. There is no... The, uh, the, the Starting again at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God... 
And the firmament, that is the whole expanse of the heavens, showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language. Their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now, what is your question? Yes, um, concerning not only family radio, but all of God's children, how does the how do these verses apply? And I will take my answer over the year. Thank well, the you. fact is, you see, uh, is start. Uh, look at verse one. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show this hand handiwork. Wherever we look, whether we're looking through a microscope at at the tiniest particle of uh, of, of whatever this. A world consists of, or whether we're looking in a telescope out into the far distant uh, uh, galaxies of the universe, or whether we're looking in the sea at all of the exotic creatures in the sea, or the rainforest and all the uh, exotic creatures in the rainforest, or wherever we look, we see the handiwork of God. Everything is so complex. Everything is so intricate. Intricate. It is. It is uh, way beyond our imagination how someone, how all of this could come into being. Except, except, it had to require a divine mind to think it all out and create it. And only because God is an infinite God, infinite in his knowledge, infinite in his ability, uh, in his creation ability, so he could speak and bring this into existence, does it, uh, does it exist? And all of this is just shouting at us the glory of God. I always uh, think it is an enormous pity, an enormous pity, we watch a, uh, let's say a travel, a, a travelogue or 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 a, a scientific picture on TV from National Geographic or Nature or something of that, and it's it's giving a lot of information about some animal or some bird or some insect, and we see all of the uh, the way that uh, what, what they've learned about that. And then the narrator will say, you see, this is the way this creature has adapted itself through the eons of time. And you just want to shout, say, no, 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 no creature could adapt itself in such a unique, absolutely unique way. Can't you see? It requires someone to design all of this and to uh, and to create all of this this is shouting at us there is a creator god and uh, because of man's stubbornness and because man uh, refuses to acknowledge god they they still come again and again and say yeah you see uh, this was all formed through the eons of time without a god at all but thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my call, and can I say thanks to Family Radio for taking some time to explain about Independence Day and the lives that uh, were taken for our freedom. I just wanted to say thank you to Family Radio for doing that. That was very nice. And I just have two questions. Go ahead with your question. Okay. <clears throat> Regarding the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I know that Jesus is the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the, is the Lord of hosts that spoke through the scribes. But how do I figure out where the, where the Father fits in there? I know it's a weird question, but uh, can you help me with that? Well, first of all, we have to remember when we talk about God, whether we're talking about God the Holy Spirit or God the, Son, Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also called the Son of God, or whether we're talking about God the Father, 
we are talking about eternal God. We read about the Lord Jesus. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We read about the Lord Jesus that he created all things, and yet the Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 2, or in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and so on. And we, while God presents himself to us as three distinct personalities, nevertheless there is one God, and our human minds were not designed designed by God to be able to to uh, uh, think out a that kind of a God uh, uh, or a God for example who could speak and bring this complex universe into existence we can't we can't possibly uh, imagine how all of that is possible all we do is read the Bible and any statement by God we take at face value that is true that is true, but I don't understand it. I don't know how it fits into uh, the other statements about God, except that I know it's absolutely true. Uh, we just have to be very humble when we start uh, uh, talking about God. Thank you. So can I ask one more question? Yes. It's a two-part question. It has to do with um, something that my mother said. She's still in the churches, and she claims that it's equally as important to uh, be with other believers as it is to be studying the Bible. And also, um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. And also, you say that God is separating the wheat from the tares by having people come out of the church. Uh, how, how is he separating the wheat from the tares outside of the church? Well, the first of all, uh, for 1900 and over 1950 years, God had a divine, had created a divine organis, organism or organization called the local congregation. That is, it's sometimes just called the church. Uh, and and uh, uh, within that church, uh, there were spiritual overseers that were to be appointed. Uh, the, there were certain uh, rules and laws that had to be followed that are carefully st set forth in the Bible. And in that church, you became a member, and uh, the church overseers declared that you were a member in full communion and uh, looked upon you as a true believer. And, and everybody stood on the same ground in each local congregation once they became a member. They were all members in full communion, all recognizing each other as being faithful, true believers. On the other hand, God has stipulated that, no, it, while they all look outwardly like they were true believers and no human being, no elder or deacon or pastor could read the heart of any of these individuals. The true fact was that these two, true, these apparent true believers who were confessing members uh, full, in full communion in that local congregation were made up of two kinds of people. Some were true believers and some were not true believers. They just looked like true believers. And there was no mechanism set up uh, that God had set up at all throughout the church age whereby there could be a separation of the wheat and tares. God says you can't separate them because if you try to throw out the, the tares, you may be throwing out wheat because there's no... the the, the Tares look so much like the wheat. Only God knows who the true wheat is and who the tares are. But in our day, God has set up the mechanism whereby there can become a separation, and that is the, the mechanism was the command that we are to come out of the local congregation. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody who comes out is automatically wheat. Uh, there can be tares that come out also. But at least, at least the wheat, the true believers, 
uh, before the church ages, but before Christ returns, will all have come out. They will not remain. Now, there may be those in the congregation who are elect of God, who are neither wheat nor tares. They have not even become saved as yet. But they, too, will be driven out by God. They cannot remain there because it, God is, will not save them while they're in the congregation. And if they are elect of God, uh, God is obligated to save them. And so they, too, will come out. They will come out because it's outside of the church that God does the saving. And uh, that is simply the way God has designed this now. And uh, so if we, uh, whether we know for sure or think for sure we're saved or whether we think uh, maybe I'm not saved makes no difference. The last place we want to be right now is in a local congregation because on the other side of the coin, God is saying he's preparing those in the local congregations for the judgment throne. He has sent a strong delusion upon them uh, to make them believe a lie, as we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and, uh, and all the preparation is going on so that these people in the local congregations who are trusting finally in their church, that's why they don't come out. They, they uh, after all, uh, it's their church that, that uh, has told them that they're a child of God and it's the church that they believe has uh, really been the, made the difference in getting them saved and so on. And so they're trusted there rather than in Christ and uh, they in turn will be the first at the judgment throne. So being with other people isn't equally as important as studying the Bible? Well, now, now we have the other question that you raised uh, what does the Bible say about meeting with other people? It's true that throughout the church age, we were to meet with others. For over 1950 years, that was the rule. We are to come together as a congregation. But the interesting and significant thing is, when we read the Bible carefully, really carefully, trying to find anything in the Bible that has to do with what happens when, at this time, when, we're, when we can't be a part of a local congregation, we don't find any statements calling for uh, to meet together as a congregation. I'll finish this right after this message. God has designed mankind to uh, where we do find comfort in each other. We, uh, we find, for example, that in the family, uh, the husband and wife find enormous comfort in each other. If it's a proper relationship that's existing there, the children have strength and comfort in their parents and their parents in their children. And friends meeting together can encourage one another. And a group of people who are of like mind, uh, spiritually particularly, uh, or even uh, just uh, in a social fashion, if they're of like mind, they do find comfort and encouragement uh, between each other. God has designed us that way. But in this day, when we're right in the wrap-up, in the final harvest, when God is bringing to pass the, the uh, ultimate saving program of the Bible, we're learning that really all that's really important is not me and my fellow man, but me and God. Me and God. God is absolutely sufficient for any human being. We ultimately do not need each other. We think we do. We are, we, uh, we are accustomed to this. And throughout the church age, for example, which most of us have come out of or have been a part of, we have been encouraged along that line. But now we're learning that, that it's me and God, and that's really sufficient because God is sufficient for everything. That's why the Bible says, I can do all things through my fellowship with my other friends. No, it doesn't say that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
uh, uh, he is the one who will never leave me nor forsake me. He is the one through whom I get my comfort from. He has given us the word of God. Incidentally, it's also at this time that we have a, a much, much greater understanding, potentially, potential greater understanding of the Bible than ever before. Uh, we we uh, read the Bible with far more accuracy. And, of course, that brings us comfort. We have a lot more knowledge of the timeline of history and where we are and what God's plan is in the next uh, from now until the very end. And that also brings us enormous comfort if we are a true child of God. So the whole, the whole situation <coughs> is very unique and different from what it has been heretofore. And, and uh, therefore, we're not really surprised when we find uh, that we don't find anything in the Bible that I'm aware of. Now, I may have missed a verse someplace, but I haven't, I don't know where it is yet. Uh, but uh, I've found nothing that indicates that it's God's intention that we should seek the fellowship of others, individuals, if for mutual comfort and encouragement and so on. The focus is me and God, me and God, each one of us, me and God. Even when we teach on family radio, yes, family radio brings comfort as we bring music, as we bring teaching of various kinds. But frankly, it's not family radio that can comfort you or the, uh, the, the messages that you hear or the speakers that you hear on family radio. What really is the comfort is the message that is being brought as you are directed more and more into the Word of God and, and helped in understanding the Word of God uh, more, more, uh, in a more uh, true way. And that is where you will uh, more and more get your comfort and your encouragement from. Right. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campin. Yes. Yes, this is what you have said. You said all other churches preach do-it-yourself salvation plan. Do you say that? I, Mr. Campin? Uh, that, that all of the gospel teaches God's salvation plan? No, you said all other churches teach do it yourself salvation plan well, unfortunately that is that is about the way it is because there are for example an enormous number of the churches that 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 uh, uh, don't even understand at all what God's salvation plan like what the Rome, the Roman Catholic or the Mormons or the Seventh Day Adventists on the other hand uh, there are a, a great number of churches called the, who are really considered to be the most conservative uh, Bible ch uh, teaching churches who are basically uh, free will altogether. And they, uh, they start out with the idea that Christ went to the cross to pay for everybody's sin. So that's totally do it yourself. Then you get to the Presbyterians and they have, uh, their, uh, one of their fundamental creeds is uh, in the Westminster Confession where they are taught that faith is an instrument through which God saves us and that already uh, smacks of a do-it-yourself salvation plan even though they teach election and predestination and yet they, they muddy the water very quickly by that kind of a creed then there are the reformers and they teach that water baptism is a, is a seal that seals us into the covenant in some way, which again uh, is totally contrary to the Bible and, and uh, moves in the direction of a do-it-yourself salvation plan. I, I, I'm quite familiar with what uh, most, and in the Lutherans, for example, uh, they uh, come out very plainly that if you're baptized in water, that sets you on the way of salvation. The Church of Christ says uh, water baptism is an absolute condition 
for salvation and so on. In, in other words, uh, uh, as I've studied the various denominations and I'm fairly well acquainted with them, I don't find any that have really come out flat footed and, 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 and with very definite statement. No, God had to do everything, everything to get us saved. We made no contribution of any kind. Mr. Campen, I read the Bible before, and I keep reading the Bible. And there is nowhere in the Bible that Peter, John, James, or other apostles telling people to howl and cry tears of blood and wait for God to figure out whether to save them or not. Anytime they cry out, what shall we do to be saved? Peter says, repent, be baptized, uh, you know, uh, all other things, believe. This is what the Bible says. This is what Peter, Paul, James, and all those people yeah, excuse are saying. Me. Excuse, those... excuse me. I know you're very excited about this and very upset about this, and I can understand that. But you must remember that uh, you, uh, we read a, any verse in the Bible, and you, you, uh, you quoted some verses, we have to repent, we have to believe, we have to do this, and so on. But, but the biblical rule is, and this is instruction from God himself, we're to compare spiritual things with spiritual. That is, we cannot look at that statement and, and look at a few other verses that are similar in character and say, now God very plainly says this or says that. And that's the end of the matter. We know we have the truth. I, we cannot stop with that. We have, we have to learn. And this is what has not been observed by the churches. The very fact that the Baptists do not agree with the Lutherans on many doctrines, and the Lutherans don't agree with the Presbyterians on many doctrines, and the Presbyterians with the Roman Catholics, and so on, is clear evidence that, that somehow... Uh, the teach, some, uh, most people are making a mistake in what they're teaching, and maybe all have made a mistake. And, and so we have to stop right there and say, now, before we go any further, we have to check these questions out by examining the whole Bible and making sure that we are in harmony with everything the Bible teaches. And uh, then we find... Uh, that none of the denominations uh, will will uh, be able to answer to the whole Bible. They all are, are without re realizing it in all likelihood, rejecting or setting aside many verses of the Bible that would not be in harmony with their conclusion as to what they teach. And so uh, you uh, have been brought up in a church somewhere, and you have been told these things, and, and you have learned these verses very, very uh, carefully and diligently, and you're very familiar with them, and you've been told these verses are the Word of God, and the Word of God is infallible, so that you have put your trust in those verses, but you have not been told that these conclusions have been carefully researched through the whole Bible and that uh, these uh, that your teachers are ready to face any and every verse in the Bible that might relate uh, that is has not been done and that's where the problem is now in God's mercy at this time when it's still the day of salvation think of this this is the mercy of God Right now, we have almost 7 billion people living in the world. And, and they can, uh, they can uh, uh, be uh, uh, told, and we have to tell them, that the whole Bible has to be uh, put into harmony with what we teach. That is, uh, what we teach has to be in harmony with anything and everything in the Bible. And we should not hesitate for a moment to cast away a doctrine that is not faithful to the whole Bible, even though 
uh, this is going to step on the toes uh, of, of all kinds of people who are who are con have been convinced by their local congregation that they have the truth of the Bible, and so it's it's a difficult time. I can understand your anguish and your uh, your uh, uh, trouble trouble that you're going through as you're hearing these things, but this is not a time for us to try to comfort ourselves in unbelief or in something that's incorrect. This is the time to look at these matters squarely in the eye. I want the truth. I want the truth. And if it means I have to throw away a whole lot of what I have been taught uh, and to rethink all of this and make sure that I have the whole Bible, so be it. But I want the truth. That should be the posture of every every person. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Hello. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campy. Uh, just as you feel compelled to speak the truth, as you know it from the Bible, um, I have to tell you something that you may find hard to believe, but I was saved in 2004 by God, spiritually saved, and then um, I come to realize that I was the woman in the Bible in Revelations who was carrying a child that the devil was persecuting to destroy. And on Halloween of 2004, there, there was a big harvest moon there. Um, I was... I was outside, and the moon and two stars, I believe to be angels, were to take me to heaven to get me away from the devil, which I was persecuted from. And um, Satan was in my home, and I was waiting outside and waiting and praying spiritually in connection with God. See, Armageddon had already started, and that was just a part of it. Yeah, where now, excuse, the devil me, was persecuting excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Now, you, your mind has been carrying you down a very interesting path, but none of us is uh, in accordance with the Bible. You are not the woman of Revelation 12. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that, uh, uh, that uh, whatever you were uh, thinking about was preying on your mind, and it became a part of your personality. But God is not speaking that way to us today at all. He's speaking through his word. And, and while you personally uh, began to identify with things in the Bible, the fact is you were go going out of bounds insofar as what the Bible would allow. You have to keep reading uh, that passage and, and comparing it with the scriptures, not with a harvest moon or or uh, two stars that you think are angels or something, that simply is our own minds that are going down a wrong path. So I would not encourage you at all to think about that experience. Get back into the Bible and stay with the Bible and not with your experience. But that is in the Bible. Well, no, excuse me. The, the account is in the Bible. But your experience is not in the Bible. Your experience is something that's out of your own mind. Uh, the God is not speaking to us in any way except through his word. And uh, so the moment you begin to, uh, to uh, make that a, a, some kind of a reality in your life as you are speaking about it right now, uh, that should have been... An, uh, a note to you, wait, I'm going down the wrong path. I'm, I'm somehow, somehow I got sidetracked here from the Bible, and I'm looking at me now rather than the Bible. But I know this from God. Well, that's what you thought was from God because it came into your mind. But God will not violate his own law. He won't violate the word of God. And so but the fact that, the fact that, that uh, you are not the woman, you, uh, those two stars were not angels, that uh, you didn't read that in the Bible anywhere, and the very fact that you decided that that was the case indicated that you were trusting your mind 
you were not trusting the Bible. You were picking up ideas from the Bible and incorporating them in your mind. This was all very self-subconscious, of course. You weren't consciously doing this, but it ended up with, with some conscious thinking about how you related and and you you just know you have to know that no I got that I was going down a wrong path oh Lord help me get back just into the Word of God and and forget about all of that kind of an experience but that is the Word of God it does speak of the woman uh, there's three women I believe in Revelation I'm, I'm sorry I can't make you understand I just have to tell you the way it is you it is not you are not the woman. You were simply associating something in the Bible with some kind of an experience that you had that that uh, put you in a uh, into a wrong position. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Campy. Yes. Hey, uh, could you read um, Ezekiel 28:2 for me, please? Ezekiel 28, verse 22? No, verse 2. Verse 2. Ezekiel 28, let's look at that. Verse 2. Um, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, uh, and so on. Now, what is your question? Okay, so I understand that um, you, you believe, and I believe correctly, that you believe that this is mankind. Yes. Okay, was there ever a time when you believed that this was Satan? No, I never had that problem, although I've read many commentaries in my lifetime about this, and pretty universally it has been taught by the church theologians that uh, passed that this is talking about Satan. Okay, now, um, I just noticed some parallel language with this in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. If you pay attention to the words like what he said, what well, you just... What, well, there is, there is a parallel language. There's parallel language between this also and Isaiah 14. Yes. That's why, that's why theologians have thought this was talking about Satan. But you have to remember that mankind uh, who is not saved is under the authority of Satan and thinks like Satan. Why do you think that so many people... Uh, believe that uh, they don't uh, they don't that there is no God they believe they are God they believe that they know everything uh, they uh, they uh, in other words uh, Satan ha wants to be like God but so does man 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 uh, uh, mankind himself uh, really believes that he is the master of his fate the captain of his soul uh, it's uh, and we get our lessons of course from Satan Okay, um, like in Ephesians 2.2, 2, um, if you don't, could you read that for me, please? And then I have one other question for you. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. There we read, uh, it's talking about someone who eventually did become saved. And he's, because he says in, in verse 1, And you uh, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. There you have it right there. Right. The similarity, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conduct in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Right, Brother Camping, I'm only focused on one thing in there, that God has said. God said, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What spirit is that that's working in the children of disobedience? What, oh, it what? is Satan's spirit. It is the. Uh, it is Satan. Now, the, 
remember, every human being has a spirit essence. And, and when we were created, in our spirit essence, we were energized by God. He, and he worked in the life of Adam and Eve. And, and, and in fact, uh, God himself indwelt Adam and Eve in their spirit essence. But then they rebelled against God and they became spiritually dead so that God broke the, uh, the, uh, the line between God and man so they're no longer mankind, unsaved man is no longer energized by God. He still has a spirit essence. Uh, he's no longer indwelt by God and he is now available to the spirits, the evil spirits like Satan and his uh, fallen angels uh, to be energized by him and to be indwelt by him. And that's what it's talking about here, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We know that Satan's not omnipresent. And I was just wondering, it says the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I'm just wondering how, I mean, the whole world, you almost like you just said, you got 7 billion people were getting close to being on the face of the earth. And it's like, how does the spirit of disobedience work in each one of them? It's just, well, um, first of all, it is their own spirit. Every individual has a spirit essence. That's his soul. And it is working in, it's disobedient against God. Mankind did not lose his personality. His personality is that we were created with a physical body that is kept alive by the breath of life, exactly like an animal's physical body is kept alive by the breath of life. But in addition, every human being was given a spirit essence or a soul, and that remains even though we have become, say, even though we became under the wrath of God, but it is no longer being worked by God. It is there uh, where mankind, just like we read in Ezekiel 28, where mankind said, I am God. I don't need God. I, I, I can work out my life, thank you, all by myself. And at the same time, he can get, get assistance from time to time to become more sinful by the action of Satan, although you're correct. Satan is not am, omnipresent. He, and even with the legions of evil spirits, that the, the angels that fell with him, he still can't be everywhere at the same time. But nevertheless, uh, that potential exists that he can come into the life of any individual. Okay, um, I would go further in this, but um, see, I believe, um, I know you don't, I know a lot of people don't, I didn't until the last uh, maybe two years or so, that I've learned that God uses, um, there's synonyms like um, serpent, red devil, whatever God's saying, Satan, they're referred to as the whole, all these people coming together and making up this harlot woman, which he is another name for Satan. It's the heart of man that is... Oh, 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 excuse me. But I know... Okay, get, excuse so, me. I, I, I have to stop you because you're, you're going contrary to the Bible. Satan is a personality. When Jesus was in the 40 days tempted of Satan, he was not tempted by the heart of man. He was being tempted by a person a fallen angel called Satan, or the dragon, or the devil. And, and uh, you, may, uh, you may have arrived at a conclusion that you think is unique or special or more accurate, but, but you're not taking into account everything the Bible teaches. And Satan is a distinct person. And, uh, and God has uh, put him... Uh, given him the rule over mankind in order that sin might become more sinful so that man might recognize more quickly his need of a savior. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Camping. How you doing? Yes. Hey, uh, in regards to the caller who called a few calls ago, he was quoting scriptures from the Bible that I've heard you say before are actually the law of God. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Call upon the name of Jesus. Seek the Lord. All these things, receive God, choose God. And something I learned from your station not too long ago was 
That is the law of God. Those are commands of God, the law of God. Now, those, no one can be saved by keeping the law of God. You have to keep it perfectly. Would you elaborate on that? Well, that's, you, you've got a, made a very excellent point there. If we could believe perfectly, if we could repent perfectly, uh, 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 but of course we can't, and, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, therefore, while that is a true, a true statement, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, the fact is nobody will believe. In fact, the Bible says that very plainly. There's none that seeketh after me, no, not one. So while the statement is true, it's a faithful declaration of the law of God, it is something that will not be realized because of the fallen condition of man, the depravity of man. And thank you for uh, reminding us of that. That's a very good point you make. And shall we take our this uh, message first? We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Hello, um, <clears throat> uh, Brother Camping. <clears throat> I'm I'm looking at um, Isaiah Isaiah chapter fifty four. Isaiah fifty four. Yes, yeah, verse seven. Um, right. before, let's, before. let's look at that. Isaiah 54, verse 7. 54, verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness... Well, I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Now, what is your question? Um, I understand that most of, most of Isaiah 54 is about the elect, but I'm wondering here what exactly is the small moment, and who is it exactly that he is forsaken? Well, the first of all, we know he's talking about those who are the elect of God because he's saying, I will gather thee, I will, uh, with everlasting kindness, will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord. So it has to be talking about those who do become saved. Now, what was our condition before we became saved? It, we were under the wrath of God. Remember Ephesians chapter 2, where it says we were just like the others who are not the elect of God. We were under the wrath of God. Now, he's saying just for a small moment. Now, think of this. We, uh, we uh, let's say we're 80 years old when we became saved. Uh, that mean, meant that we've lived for 80 years under the wrath of God because before we're saved, uh, we, uh, our sin brings God's wrath. And we are like we're living in hell spiritually. We're under the wrath of God. Then God sa saves us. He, he is obligated to save us at some point because uh, we were chosen of God from before the foundation of the world. And when he went to the cross, he made payment for our sins. And finally, at the year age of 80 years of age, he saved us. Is that a small moment of our life? Yes, it is. Because how long is our life? Oh, well, maybe we might live to be uh, 90 years old before we die but that's not the that's not our life our life is from the moment we were conceived until the end of eternity future and eternity future is forevermore and so that 80 years is a drop in the ocean compared with the with the longevity of the time when we have become a child of god Okay, um, yes, um, but uh, I spoke with some other believers, and they might have thought um, that this small moment was talking about the, the little season of revelation or, or uh, the little season of the tribulation, but um, I, I don't know if that's possible. But I'm wondering, could we also say that he's forsaken us before we're saved because when Adam and Eve sinned, he forsook the whole, entire human race? Well, let's read Ephesians 2 again. Let's read, uh, let's see what God says about this. 
he says, where in time past, he's talking about the one who did become saved, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conduct in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, that is, even as the those who never did become saved. And so we were, and and where did God find us? Where did remember He des, He descended into the lower parts of the earth, as we read in Ephesians four, and He led captivity captive. Who, who were, what were we? Uh, who did He lead captivity captive? Everyone He came to save. We were captives of Satan. We were under the wrath of God. We were spiritually in hell. And God, uh, Christ went to hell to pay for our sins and brought us out of hell. And so uh, we don't have to, uh, uh, we, we can see that this deals directly with everyone who becomes saved throughout the history of the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campion? Yes. Uh, the book of Isaiah? Yes. 47? Isaiah 47. Let's look at that. Uh, verse 1 through 11, if possible. 47. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Delicate, Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance, and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient, hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke, and thou saidst, It shall be, I am a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things in thine heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. And so on. Uh, now, the, uh, this is, uh, of course, paralleling, paralleling the language of Revelation chapter um, 17. Uh, and chapter 18, where it talks about the woman on the scarlet uh, beast, uh, who says, "I am uh, queen, and I am uh, I am no widow," and and so on, and uh, and the language is very parallel to that. Okay, I was coming out of uh, the church a couple Sundays ago. I'm still a member, but I'm indecisive. And a young man handed me a flyer. And it said uh, the church age has ended, and it, it 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 wrote every word of this chapter, Isaiah 47. Is this relating to the church today? Oh yes, it definitely is relating to the church today. It is, uh, in fact, uh, the whole book of Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah as it talks about the priests and the prophets, uh, and uh, uh, the pastors. And uh, all of that is talking about the church today, how God looks at it. And and uh, there's just a whole lot of information about this. Uh, that's why uh, what you might do to get even a lot more verses uh, that speak to this issue, uh, call or write Family Radio and get the books, The End of the Church Age and After, and Wheat and Tares after the parable of the wheat and tares in Matthew 13. And uh, there's just a lot more information that will help us to see uh, what God has to say about the church situation of our day. Yeah, in 13 years, I've never ever read this chapter. I've ne in 13 years as a member of the church, I've never even come close to this. And it was an eye-opener because all, 
all the pastoral staff teaches is how much God will bless you and how much more members we want in our church. And I, I think I've had it. Yeah, well, but, be very careful. Don't make a move until you are quite sure of what the Bible is saying. But these books that I just uh, offered, they're... they're uh, they, of course, are not the authority. The Bible is the authority, but they are written in a way to direct us into a whole lot of scriptures that deal with these matters, wheat and tares, and the end of the church age and after. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camp. I called a little while ago, and you didn't let me get to my next subject, because I think you got upset about the Satan thing. So, But I want to um, ask you about Exodus 23.9, if you could read that for me and just comment on, on that for me, please. Ex Exodus 23.9? Yes. All right, let's look at that. Exodus 23, 23, verse 9. There we read... Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, what is what is your question yes, about that? I know what you teach, that you can't know the heart of another. And even though there's, there's many other verses, like in Matthew 15, 18, where God says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. Now, if we hear a false gospel coming from someone's mouth, um, <laughs> um, it does reflect their heart. And so, in in most instances, we can know the heart or the false gospel of a. Well, of no, another. excuse me, excuse me. Uh, we can know something about the heart of man uh, when they are uh, when they are obviously speaking very wickedly, uh, and uh, and uh, although we don't know whether that person potentially might be one of God's elect, he could still become saved. That we don't know. Abs absolutely, we don't know. But what is what is uh, the area that we don't know the heart of man is in the local congregations, because there we are trained to say the same words. The same words come out of the mouth of every uh, member of that congregation. They are quoting the same verses. They are uh, they are uh, taking the same attitude toward things. And they do, but those words that come out do not necessarily reflect whether that person is a true, true child of God or not. There's no way that we can know. We cannot know the heart. You have to remember. Remember what Jesus said? If a man looks at a woman, he's already committed adultery with her. Now, you could have a pastor or the most holy man in your congregation who uh, in all of his outward uh, actions was as circumspect uh, in sexual matters and in moral matters as you could ever ask for. And yet in his mind he could be, uh, be thinking uh, lasciviously, he could be thinking uh, sexually uh, in a very immoral way, and you and I would never know it because we can't read his mind, but God can. God can. And that's why there's no way that we can, uh, that, that there was any, there was any physical way that, that mankind, the elders and the deacons and the pastor who have the spiritual oversight of the congregation could set up machinery to separate the wheat from the tares. That was impossible. Camping. Um, I believe what God means about lusting after another woman. We know the the carnal understanding of that is what you're saying <clears throat> is, is like lusting after a woman, like um that we see after the eyes. But I believe what God means there is the harlot woman. There's a virtuous woman, which is the the ones who have the true uh, spiritual ex truth. Ex excuse me. He means simply that if you are looking lustfully at a woman, whether she's a harlot or just a very lovely moral person. The fact is, you are looking at that woman with wrong eyes. You are looking at it with lust in your heart. And you've already committed adultery with her, God declares. And you can't, you can't lessen the force of that statement. In other words, our minds, and remember, if you go back to 
uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And let's keep this in mind when we talk about the law of God. Uh, there, God talks about his law, at, which is, which is of course, uh, person, person, personified in the Lord Jesus himself, uh, because Christ is the law. But he says in verse 12, For the word of God, this is Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, there's no human being that can say, I am able to do these things as I look at another person. But God can, and God is the judge. We are not the judge. And so, uh, indeed, uh, indeed, someone can be as, uh, uh, for as, for as we see them, they can see them be the most lovely Christians in the world. Oh, my. They're really uh, examples of what a child of God really is. And yet God might look at the heart of that individual and say, no way, no way. That person is uh, uh, has no. Uh, he's, he's outwardly he's looking like it, but inward he's still a a uh, cesspool of wickedness. Camping, can I, can I have a second, please, brother Camping? Yes. Yes, I agree with you a thousand percent in the car in carnality. Yes, that's why in Romans eight eight God says the carnal mind is hatred with God. It's not subject to God's laws. Neither indeed can be. So when I hear somebody say. Uh, for instance, you can accept Jesus as your personal Savior. I know that is the words of a harlot woman because you cannot accept Christ as your personal Savior. Christ has to accept you. He, he had to make you and predestinate you and create you for his purpose. I understand that, but that is the words of the harlot woman. The virtuous woman, she'll never say those things. That is a true child of God. They come to learn these things um, by well, the Holy now, Spirit. Now, excuse me. Now, again, you are drawing, you are setting up the, the uh, definitions. Uh, can a can a a person who's not saved teach true doctrine? Of course, he can if he's been trained in that. Uh, there are pastors who, uh, in the church age, who were true believers. There were pastors who were not true believers. Only God knows the difference. And they were teaching identical doctrines. So you can't say that just because a person is teaching correctly that that automatically makes him a child of God. That's not, that doesn't follow. It is, it, 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 it what, what, what comes out of the mouth of a man or a woman is not the true indicator of what's going on in their heart. Only God knows what's in their heart. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hi, Mr. Camping. Uh, could we uh, look at Romans 10, uh, 13? Romans 10, verse 13. Let's look at that. There we read. In Romans 10, verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's uh, my ministry to uh, share with everyone, as God has called me to do by spreading the gospel in the world, to, to humble yourselves, Mr. Campion, you and all, all who are listening by radio, that, that, that they would be uh, humble and like a child and come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings, and just bow their knees before now, him. Now, excuse me, excuse me. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's a child that's six months old. How does that child relate to this verse? Now, that child is a human being. That child is just as important as an adult. How does that child relate to this verse? Only God can answer that. Well, no, that's not true. We, yes, it is. we, we, we can, uh, you, you are, you are making some you are trying to develop a, an idea of what is required for salvation from this verse, and I'm simply uh, expanding the questions. 
uh, so that we're, as we analyze what is required for salvation, we will include what salvation really is and a good place to begin with. Well, what about the child who's six months old? How does he fit into the picture? And, I, and that person, that child, we want that child to be a child of God just as much as an adult. What if that child dies a month later? Do we, are we concerned about whether that child became saved? So, so if you've got it f figured out, really figured out what is required for salvation, then how do you handle it for that child? Because God knows in advance who, in fact, is going to become saved. God knows in advance whose heart, when called upon by the Holy Spirit, will respond by bowing to Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, please, please well, save me. Well, excuse me. Now, where do you read that, that God knows in advance? The fact is... That God chose, excuse me, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, and we have to, we can't, we can't design the salvation plan. That's exactly what man has done. They've made a, a, a man-made salvation plan. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, and this is from the mouth of God. These are not my words. These are God's word, this, words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, the Bible also says, and God says this, these are the words from God's mouth, as he says in Romans chapter 3, he says in verse uh, 10, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together, become unprofitable. Now, this is the, the human race from which God chose those that were to be his children and and it doesn't imply here in any sense that he saw he looked down the quarters of time and saw that they at some time would turn to him and as a matter of fact what about that little one year one month old baby you mean that one month old baby has no possibility of salvation because he can't choose god uh, uh, you mean that that child is, is in limbo? You mean that child is destined for hell because he has, uh, he's not able to choose? You see the, the problems you're running into? If you've got to face the whole, the whole business. You can't just uh, fragment the Bible and take a verse and, and apply it in, in a certain limited context. You have to, you have to uh, figure it out for, for every situation. And you see, that's, that's, that, uh, once we learn that God did the whole work of saving, uh, and, and He doesn't require action on our part. We, we, it is true, as one, one uh, caller has indicated, if we call upon Him with all our heart. But we can't do that because we're dead in our sins. We're all together spiritually dead. And, uh, and God has to open our hearts. He has to make us his child. And he can make that six-month-old baby or one-month-old baby a child of God just as easily as one of us who is an adult and has a little understanding of, of the Bible. Uh, it's because God takes the action. And once we, once we understand salvation God's way, then we don't have problems that we have to say, well, I don't know, God, we'll have to leave that with God. We, we, uh, God has given us an info, enough information as long as we will, will uh, uh, humble ourselves and recognize we can't trust us ourselves at all. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Um, I just had a question um, about Luke, uh, ver uh, chapter 3, and it starts with verse 23. Luke 3, 
verse 23. Luke 3, verse 23. Uh, there we read, And Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. Now, what is your question? Okay, now, um, well, it goes through the whole genealogy of Jesus, but it goes backwards to Adam. Now, when I read um, in Genesis, I forget, I think it's, I think it's 11, talks about um, the genealogy of, of, of Seth. Um, now, some of, some of the names are different when it gets like to, uh, for example, the son of Ar, Arpha, uh, I can't, I can't say it real well, A-R-P-H-A-X-A-D. Now it says his son, or no, actually, I'm sorry, Canaan's son is, uh, Salah in, in Luke, but then in, uh. It's got a different, it's got an additional name in Luke from what we find in Genesis. I was curious because I know that, uh, from your, your studying, you've come up with a, with kind of a principle of how to, how to figure out, t uh, time to creation. And, you know, with the patriarchs, instead of them being the direct, um, sons of, of the people stated in, in the Bible. But I was just wondering, does this, do you know if this in, in the uh, genealogy of Jesus here in Luke is, is this direct, uh, sons? Oh, no. No, no it's not. No. Yeah, I don't think so because it's, some of them are the same. But yeah. I'm just wondering how, I wonder why they give different. Well, because names. God, excuse me, this is one of the proofs that indicate that when it says so-and-so begat so-and-so, it's not necessarily talking about a, an immediate son, because in, in uh, Genesis it's so-and-so uh, begat so-and-so, and, uh, and yet the same two names have another name in between, in Luke chapter 3, so-and-so begat someone else, and then someone else begat the second so-and-so. And so we, uh, we therefore, uh, are being taught by God to now be careful, just because God is using that language, so-and-so begat so-and-so. That doesn't mean that it was an immediate son. You have to look for other evidence as to how to understand that. Yeah. But, yeah, so it does prove uh, to to some degree of what what you're talking about in your your book, uh, Adam Adam Wynn, right? Yes. Because uh, it's because it's stating other names, so it shows that they weren't uh, some of those people weren't direct. Um, they were like a, a long heirs of the others stated, yeah, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, and then I just had one other question, if I could. Um, I was talking to somebody today and about, you know, what... Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. We're not going to have time to take your question. We're right at the end of time. So I'll have to say good night. And uh, thank you for calling. Let me just make one uh, little warning. Please don't a anybody call more than once a month. Because if you do call more than once a month, you run the risk that maybe then you'll not be able to call for several months. Uh, because we try to leave the phones open for as many people as possible. And so uh, we want to kind of spread out the opportunity by not having anybody call more than once a month. But with that, I have to say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.